in our essay 315 and we go down to the requirements here it is identifying and assessing the risks of material misstatement 28 to 37 and then look at that under your applications 184 to 236 it's massive okay but let's start by going to 28 identifying and assessing the risks of material misstatements I've already highlighted here a 80 184 to 185 once we've addressed just this paragraph we'll go to those so in identifying the risks of material misstatement the auditor shall determine whether they exist at financial statement level or the assertion level and the auditor shall determine the relevant assertions and the related significant transactions account balances and disclosures so when we determine it's at the assertion level you need to go and pick up the specific assertion okay so let's go to a 184 all the way through to 204 184 says we identify the risks of material misstatement so that we can determine the nature time and extent of the further audit procedures in order for us to express our opinion in gathering this information we perform risk assessment procedures and this is the basis for our identification of those risks of material misstatement so when we identify the risks we look at inherent risks because we do so before we look at controls we've got to use our assertions to help identify the different types of misstatements so it's not just over or understated and that's it it's how it could be over or understated and then guys look how important this is they go and give you the definitions of each assertion so if you don't know your assertions but you can see there's a risk you can come here read the different definitions of the assertions to pin which assertion is applicable so occurrence they say that transactions have been recorded and they did occur and they pertain to the entity when we're looking at the risk we say they were recorded but they shouldn't have been because they didn't occur or don't pertain to the entity but they give us the assertion that it did completeness assertion that all transactions have been recorded we see the risk they haven't accuracy transaction amounts are recorded appropriately we see it they aren't cuts off recorded in the correct period we see it as a risk that it's not classification in proper accounts we see it as incorrect accounts presentation and disclosure it's been appropriately aggregated or disaggregated so that it is presented in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework for account balance they say existence they all exist assets liabilities and equity we see it as risk that they don't rights and obligations they have the right to the assets and the liabilities are the obligations of the entity and we see it as a risk that they don't have the rights or obligation completeness all assets liabilities and equity that should have been recorded have been recorded that's their assertion we see the risk that it's not accuracy valuation and allocation they are recorded at the appropriate amounts and any valuation or allocation adjustments have been appropriately recorded we see it as not classification assets liabilities and equity properly recorded in proper accounts and we see it as incorrect accounts presentation assets and liabilities have been appropriately aggregated or disaggregated according to the applicable financial reporting framework okay then risks at the financial statement level these are risks that have a pervasive effect on the financial statements and therefore require an overall response in terms of ISA 330 in addition the risks at the financial statement level also affect individual assertions and so in identifying these risks the auditor must assess 
the risk at the assertion level. So if we pick up risks at the financial statement level, we must assess if they affect specific assertions. If we can't identify the specific assertion, then we're going to leave it as just a risk at the financial statement level and understand that every possible balance or transaction could be misstated because of it. Okay, in identifying and assessing the risks at the financial statement level, we've got to assess how it pervasively affects the financials as a whole. Okay, and that this could increase the risk at the assertion level. And yeah, they give an example. So if they have liquidity issues, then the going concern basis could be incorrect. And so the proper basis being a liquidation would be more appropriate. But if they still record it on the going concern basis, it's incorrect. Financials could be materially misstated. Okay, the risk at the financial statement level is influenced by their internal control, control environment, risk assessment, and their monitoring. And always remember the risk of material misstatement due to fraud and how that could affect the risks of material misstatement at a financial statement level. So an example, the entity's financials are going to be used in discussion with lenders in order to secure further capital. There's now a greater susceptibility to misstatement due to fraud so that they secure that capital. How? They're going to overstate assets and revenue, understate liabilities and expenses. Okay, auditor must understand the control environment because if the control environment is weak, it may even raise doubts on our ability to get evidence and therefore we might want to withdraw. So concerns about management integrity means the risk that the financial statements may be misrepresented everywhere such that the auditor cannot actually conduct an audit. Or if there's a change in the IT environment and there's a concern with regards to the reliability of the accounting records as a result of that. Okay, risk at the assertion level, appendix 2, we've already said, very important. These do not relate pervasively to the financials, but rather to specific balances or transactions. Okay, and there's just some examples of disclosures that could be significant, and that's because there is the presentation and disclosure assertion. Just, you can have a look at which disclosures they believe could be significant. We then move on to assessing the risks of material misstatement at the financial statement level. So it's now the assessing, not the identification. So for the identified risks, the auditor shall determine the effect on the assessment of the risks at the assertion level and evaluate the nature and extent of the pervasive effect on the financials. Okay, so we already said, if there's a risk at the financial statement level, we need to go and see if it affects specific assertions or if it just affects the financials as a whole. And then how, what is this pervasive effect on the financials? Okay, guys, we've already looked at A193 to A200 and then assessing the risk at the assertion level. So how do we do that? We need to assess the likelihood and the magnitude. And how do we do that? We've got to look at the inherent risk factors and the susceptibility of assertion to misstatement. And we've got to look at the risks of material misstatement at the financial statement level and their effect on the assessment of the inherent risks. And guys, that susceptibility, that was all of those complexity, the susceptibility to fraud, the subjectivity, change, all of those factors. Okay, then the auditor shall determine whether any of the assessed risks of material misstatement are significant risks and determine if then any accounts where substantive procedures alone will not be sufficient. 
and then only assessing control risk if you plan to test the operating effectiveness of controls. Okay, so let's go to these A paragraphs, starting from 205. Assessing the risks at the assertion level, we first assess inherent risk, the likelihood and the magnitude, so that we can design further audit procedures to address these risks. Okay, and we're looking for the class of transactions or the account balances that are susceptible to material misstatement. And that is now the spectrum. So the spectrum is where the likelihood and the magnitude are both high. So there's significance of a material misstatement here. So likelihood, the possibility that it may occur. Magnitude, you're looking at qualitative and quantitative factors to determine the material size or nature. Pervasive risks at the financial statement level, so looking at the financial statement levels and the effect on the assertions and the specific assertion and account balance or transaction that you are currently assessing. When it comes to significant risks, these are where the auditor needs to pay a bit more attention. And you're going to have to look at the controls that are there to address this. Guys, the rest here is all about the performing, so I'm not going to address that now. We'll look at those and the effect of assessing a significant risk when we look at the addressing them next week. Determining significant risk, they are assessed as higher on that spectrum. So magnitude and likelihood are considered higher. And there's just a couple examples here. So something like a cash supermarket retailer, you would think that there is a high likelihood of cash being stolen. However, it's a low magnitude because they keep low levels of cash, so we wouldn't actually consider this significant because both magnitude and likelihood are not high. However, goodwill impairment, likelihood would be high, magnitude would be high, so it would be considered a significant risk. And look at that, guys. Goodwill, there will be subjectivity in determining it. There will be complexi complexity in determining the figure. So those two are high. And then there's just some examples of your significant risks. So transactions where there's multiple accounting treatments and therefore there's subjectivity. Where there's estimates, so there's uncertainty or subjectivity, complexity in collecting the data, complex calculations, accounting principles where it's subject to different interpretations, so subjectivity, and then changes. Where substantive procedures alone cannot get evidence, once again guys, we're going to look at that next week when we get to performing, so I'm not going to worry about that, but then in assessing the risk of material misstatement, we then need to go and assess the control risk, but only if we plan to test controls. So guys, if you are not going to test controls, you do not need to assess the control risks. Evaluating audit evidence obtained from the risk assessment procedures. So here, yeah, guys, just important. The risks you've identified from performing your risk assessment procedures, if they are incorrect, your assessment is wrong, then you need to go and relook at performing additional risk assessment procedures. Okay, 230 to 232. Okay, guys, and it's quite important here. 232 says that in evaluating the audit evidence, we must consider whether we did get sufficient understanding about the entity and its environment and its internal control in order to identify risks of material misstatements and whether they give us evidence that is contradictory to the risks we identified. And just noting here that you can revise your risk assessment at any time. So if evidence comes up to say that your risk assessment was incorrect, go and revise that. Go and identify more risks 
so that your risk assessment is correct. Okay, the last thing I want you to do is just go to Appendix 2 quickly, just so that you can see those inherent risks. Guys, this is where I have those factors for determining whether it is likely and the magnitude. So here they all are. Complexity, subjectivity, change, uncertainty, or susceptibility to misstatement. And there they are explained. Complexity, subjectivity, change, uncertainty, susceptibility to fraud or management bias. Okay, and then you can go into a whole bunch of examples of risks. And this is what you will use in a question if you can't pick up risks in a scenario. Open up here and see, oh, have there been changes in the regulations? Are there complexities in the applicable financial reporting framework? Is there subjectivity in determining the figure? So is it an estimate like depreciation? Looking at economic conditions, are they unstable? The markets, are they volatile? Are they potentially losing customers? Are they going concern or liquidity issues? Okay, changes in the industry and business models. Are they expanding to new locations? Changes with HR, key personnel, any IT, but we'll get to that when we do IT. Constraints in capital, or are they able to get new capital if they need it? New legislations. Events or transactions that involved significant measurement and there's uncertainty, pending litigation. Could that affect their going concern? Opportunities to engage in fraudulent financial reporting, so where there's susceptibility to management bias or fraud. Related party transactions. Okay, and then additional risks at a financial statement level, lack of personnel with appropriate knowledge, control deficiencies in control environment, risk assessment or monitoring or history of past misstatements and errors. Okay, let's go and do that last class question. You got 4.5 minutes reading time and 22 minutes writing time. I know this is very long, but this is a really good question to prepare you for what is going to be expected of you in answering risk assessment questions.